So how's everybody doing today? And uh, um, my name is Chiradeep. I, uh, I work for Citrix Systems. And I've been uh, working on Apache Cloud Stack since uh, 2008. And uh, I'm committed to the Apache Cloud Stack project. And I'm on the PPMC. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, scalable object storage and uh, what it means for Apache Cloud Stack and uh, some kind of a uh, design uh, exercise we did with the Apache Hadoop project to explore whether Apache Hadoop could be a suitable uh, object storage layer for uh, Cloud Stack and beyond. So before I start, I'd just like a show of hands who's heard of Cloud Stack and you know, actually installed and worked with Cloud Stack. Um, okay, and um, Hadoop folks. Okay, so 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 um, I'm going to introduce Cloud Stack. Um, so for those of you who already know Cloud Stack, uh, hopefully it's not too much of a bore for you guys. I'm not going to talk much about Hadoop. I'm assuming a lot of people know more about Hadoop than Cloud Stack. It's been around for uh, five years now. So this, uh, this is roughly the agenda. I'll talk about Cloud Stack, why we need object storage for infrastructure as a service uh, software like Cloud Stack, uh, what we use today for uh, in lieu of object storage, and what are the limitations. Uh, and then we'll come up with, from first principles, what we would like for this, uh, for any object storage layer, layer uh, for, for infrastructure as a service systems. And uh, I'll describe some of the current object store integrations in Cloud Stack, and then I'll talk about, well, how can HDFS or Hadoop, which is part of the Hadoop project, be a replacement or, or a viable contender for object storage in a cloud. And finally, I'll talk about some uh, future directions. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, Cloud Stack has been incubating in the Apache uh, Foundation uh, since April last year. And, but it's actually been open source uh, longer than that, and it's been in production since 2009, so a uh, fair bit of uh, commercial and open source deployments, uh, fairly uh, solid and mature. Um, so the question you want to ask when you're building out a cloud is, uh, well, obviously the, the big gorilla here is Amazon, so well how, well, how does Amazon build a cloud? So they start off with some commodity servers, add some commodity networking, add some commodity storage. And then they use the open source uh, Zen hypervisor to kind of stitch together uh, a lot of these components. And then they have their own orchestration server. I mean, earlier today, uh, Andrea was talking about the, uh, or, uh, the activity orchestration. So, so they, they probably have something similar, uh, so similar set of services in, their, in the data center, which orchestrates the hypervisors, the networking, the storage, and the, and the, and the servers. And then they give you a very nice API, the AWS API, to interact with their, uh, with their cloud. So that includes like the EC2, which is the compute API, the S3, which is the storage API. And then they give you a, you know, some way to purchase these services, a vending platform. So, well, how do you build your cloud, right? You start off with the same thing, networking, server, storage, and it doesn't have to be commodity. You can use the, the most expensive servers you can find. Um, you, you can use any hypervisors you want, Zen, KVM, VMware, uh, even Oracle VM if you, if you wish to. And then this is where CloudStack steps in where you can orchestrate the networking, the hypervisors, the storage, uh, in order to, to give you the same cloud-like experience. And, and then you can use that with the CloudStack API or you can use it with the EC2 API. And then, or, and then you, you probably need, if you're a public service provider, uh, cloud provider, you probably need some kind of a portal to, to vend these services, to sell these services to the public. So that's how you build a cloud stack cloud. And so let's go inside uh, what's inside a cloud stack cloud. So cloud stack has this concept of a pod, which is a group of related servers, uh, which is typically a single failure domain. So usually it's like a rack of servers. So they have the same power supply, they are connected to the same switch, so the power supply fails, the rack is going to fail, the switch fails, the, the rack is going to fail. And there's usually some you know, associated primary storage with that. 
and then you connect that uh, rack to through the uh, L3 core to the internet, right? And then as you as your cloud grows bigger, you keep you know like a cook, cookie cutter, you keep adding more and more parts, and 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 then you have the uh, cloud stack management server on the left hand side to uh, the, to orchestrate everything for you. And then you can interact with CloudStack using the end user API. And if you're the cloud admin, you can use the admin API to do that. And finally, the last piece is, is the secondary storage. And I'll explain why we need uh, secondary storage in addition to the primary storage. Secondary storage is mainly used for um, permanent immutable objects, stuff that you don't ever modify once you create it. So, your templates, your, uh, your snapshots, your, uh, your ISOs. So what you do is what CloudStack orchestrates for you is that when you ask it to start a VM, it takes an image or a template of a virtual machine from the secondary store and then copies it to the, uh, the primary store like you see on the, on the bottom, uh, bottom of the slide there. And that, that allows the VM to start running on a server in that part. And, and now that you've been running the VM for some time, you want to make a backup of it, so CloudStack will let you take a snapshot of it, and the snapshot then moves to the secondary storage. All right, so simple enough, CloudStack orchestrates that for you. And then the, the neat thing about snapshots is that you can use the snapshot to create additional templates, and now you can say that, oh, I want a clone of that VM, I just snapshot it, and then uh, CloudStack will let you create a second VM which looks exactly like the first VM. So this is the, uh, the main purpose of secondary storage, to give you that um, a scalable backup storage to store your immutable uh, permanent objects like templates and snapshots and ISOs. And, and this becomes important because um, when, you, when you're running a cloud-style workload, which is quite a little bit different from your enterprise-style workloads, uh, you're, 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 you're running on a standardized cookie cutter infrastructure. It's not necessarily the greatest, the most expensive, the most reliable, the most redundant hardware you can find. Uh, but you rely on automation and efficiencies to, get, uh, to cut your cost down. And one key feature of running things on the cloud is that your IT department, you know, the, the, the server admin, the, the, uh, the network admin doesn't own your availability. You own your availability. And and as we saw that the clouds can get very big, and as you add these uh, reliable and semi-reliable components, you find that things break all the time, right? And so what the, you as an application writer, you focus on is the mean time to repair as opposed to the mean time between failures. And so here, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you've been running your VM on that hypervisor, your hypervisor disappears. Well, what do you do? Well, thank God you got a snapshot on secondary storage from which you can create your VM and get back up running, right? Boom, your, uh, your rack disappears. And then again, your primary storage is gone. So you, again, you, you go to your secondary storage and then uh, restore from backup. And then yeah, your primary storage can, and boom, maybe your whole zone disappears, right? So, so the, the typical deployment for to to handle this kind of reliability concerns is that you, you deploy a, a set of data centers uh, which are close to each other but not necessarily in the same field domain. So for example, uh, they're not gonna get flooded at the same time or they're not gonna get uh, hit by earthquake at the same time, maybe they're on different earthquake faults. So you replicate that, that zone infrastructure I was talking about in each of these data centers and then you connect them with some very low latency backbone. So, you know, maybe a millisecond, a two millisecond back. So, you know, these are within 10, 20, 30 kilometers of each other uh, to give you that kind of latency. And so, and then what you do is that if you wanted like a global scale cloud, you then you deploy multiple regions and then interconnect them over the internet. All right, so this is the regions and zones concept which uh, those of you who use Amazon should be familiar with. So 
what, what's, what's the current status of uh, secondary storage in, in CloudStack 4.0? So by default, the, the, uh, the, you deploy an NFS server to store your images and th those immutable objects I was talking about. And it's great because it can be monitored by any hypervisor. Most hypervisors understand NFS. Everybody and his uh, dog knows how to administer an NFS server. It's really easy. Um, but then it has some problems. Uh, we know it doesn't scale well. It's a very chatty uh, protocol. You want to deploy it over long distances. Then you got to think about, well, do I need a van optimizer? Um, and then, you know, and it, it is a bottleneck. I mean, you got a thousand hypervisors, and they are trying to talk to this one NFS storage server, right? And then, you know, out of the box, most of these uh, uh, NFS servers, which you can get with, NF with Linux or any of your operating systems, they're not replicated, right? Sure, you can use RAID, but what if the machine blows up, right? So there's some problems with NFS, which, you know, uh, undermine the reliability of your, of your data center. So the solution, now, uh, one solution is to use object storage, and those of you who are familiar with Amazon S3 uh, is, is what I'm talking about, which is an object storage solution which gives you a, um, a seemingly infinite amount of storage capacity where you can store and retrieve objects through HTTP uh, in, a, in a very, very, uh, very simple API. So it looks something like this here. It's still inside the region, and there's a bunch of disks inside each uh, zone, and that's managed by this object storage technology, um, something like S3. And what the object storage technology gives you is it, it replicates the objects between these, uh, between these zones. Uh, it, it audits them, make sure that there's always three copies, for example. It gives you a repair, so if uh, one copy goes out of sync, then it, you know, it makes sure there's three copies again. Uh, maintenance, usage records, you know, that's, the, that's what an object storage technology gives you. And, and this gives you reliability because Let's say you're running some VMs in, in your region. Um, you've got region, uh, VMs in all, all four zones. So the object storage is, is, is ensuring that your volumes are replicated to, uh, to each failure domain, each zone. And then, um, and then as you snapshot your uh, VMs, it, it makes sure that those uh, snapshots get copied to each of the uh, different zones so that you never ever lose your snapshot. And then so if your zone disappears, you still have a copy of your snapshot in at least one of the zones in order to be able to carry on, right? And so there you go, you're up and running again. And, and that's not the only thing. Um, it also enables other applications. I mean, if you look at S3, uh, the kind of innovation all in you know, the startups and other people have been able to bring about using just using S3, uh, by just putting an API, a simple API server in front of uh, the object storage technology, uh, you get you know applications like Dropbox. You get um, you know ability to store static content. You do uh, content delivery networks. You can ar use it for archival. So not only does object storage technology have applications in infrastructure as a service um, deployments, but it, you can repurpose or use it for other purposes like, uh, like neat applications like Dropbox, right? So what are the, some of the characteristics of object storage technology which gives you this, um, this kind of advantages? First, it's you know, highly reliable and durable. If you look at Amazon S3, it, it promises 99.9% .9 availability and 11 nines of durability. So that 11 nines of durability means that you've got to wait 10 million years before you lose anything in Amazon S3. And it's massive scale. I mean, at, at last count, uh, S3 was at uh, 1.3 trillion objects, and it's stored across all their seven regions. And they have a throughput of you know nearly a million requests per second. And so that's the kind of um, uh, the top end of the scale of object storage, and they're growing, and they're probably going to be two trillion by the end of the year. Um, 
the, the key uh, aspect of object storage is that these are immutable objects. So once you store an object in object storage, you can't, delete, you can't modify it. You can't seek to it. You can't uh, write to the 10th byte of it. You can't do anything. All you can do is delete it and replace it. And so that gives you a lot of advantages when you're designing your uh, object storage system because you don't suddenly have to worry about multiple people trying to modify the same location in the file. It becomes a much easier problem to solve. The next aspect is that it has a simple API, and this is true of almost any storage system out there, whether you look at Google storage or Azure storage or, or, or Amazon S3, it's the simple put post of objects, get objects, delete objects, and if you look at their APIs, they all look almost identical. And so there's no seek, there's no mutation, there's no POSIX semantics, it is just a few operations. So the, the last simplifying factor is that it's a flat namespace. So everything is stored in buckets or containers or whatever we call it, and these bucket names are unique. And buckets can only contain other objects. They can't contain other ob buckets. So there's no directory system, there's no extra metadata, there's no directory traversal, there's no soft links, hard links, moving stuff between directories. Everything is simplified. And finally, it's cheap and it's getting cheaper all the time. So that's another advantage of object storage. So what uh, CloudStack has is an uh, S3 compatible API server. And what it does is that it is just the API server. If you, when you deploy it, it, it writes to a POSIX file system at the back end. But it's pluggable in the sense that you can store, you can plug in any object storage technology behind it. And so it understands the Amazon S3 REST style and SOAP APIs, and it has this pluggable backend. And the backend storage needs to do very simple things. It's usually a few hundred lines of code to, uh, to integrate with the uh, S3 API front end. For example, you know, create container means that you create a bucket, you know, save object means you know, write the streaming right to, the, uh, to your object storage system. And the default backend is a, is a POSIX file system helps you get up and running, but not very you know, useful in production. And so there's uh, one vendor who integrated their object storage with, our, with the CloudStacks S3 API server. Uh, that's called Kering Object Store out of Austin. And then we also integrated HDFS. So if you look at this uh, diagram here, um, the S3 API server can talk the HDFS API to a cluster of Hadoop nodes, right? So is CloudStack handling ACLs for all of these uh, objects? That's right, it does, yeah. So, it, so what we showed you is that there's a, there's a MySQL database right there, and, and CloudStack uses that MySQL storage to store, uh, for example, bucket object mappings and then uh, object metadata like actals and bucket policies. So theoretically, does that make the MySQL database the constraint in scalability size? Depends on the object one or the, one, of the, one of the constraints, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then how, well, this is, you know, the S3 API server, but object storage uh, in general inside CloudStack, uh, how would you use it? So as I said before, you use it for immutable stuff like images and snapshots, and as a replacement for the NFS secondary storage, or you can augment your secondary storage and use it to uh, distribute your uh, templates and images throughout, uh, throughout the region. And today we have integrations available with uh, React CS and OpenStack Swift. And what's upcoming in, in, the, in the next release, which is the June release, is a framework for integrating uh, more storage providers which can uh, store uh, CloudStack snapshots and CloudStack uh, images and templates onto object storage. So that's uh, the, the, the current state of the art. And so the next part of the talk, we'll talk about, well, what could we build um, given that we want a general purpose object storage server, which can not only satisfy your infrastructure as a service needs, 
but also do uh, neat stuff like, uh, like, a, like a Dropbox application. Um, so here are some you know, uh, straw man requirements. You want it to be open source. You want it to be, hopefully, in the Apache Software Foundation. You want it to scale to at least a billion objects. I mean, that's table stakes these days. I mean, if, if Amazon's at a trillion objects, you don't want to be doing 10 million objects, right? So you want reliability and durability on power with S3. You know, that's a that's good goal to have. Uh, you want to be able to um, imitate the S3 API or the Google Storage API. These are all very similar APIs, so once you get one, you got pretty much got the other ones. And you want tooling around maintenance, audit, repair, usage records, <coughs> and you know, which is specific to that object storage. So the, the following slides you know, are talking about a theoretical design. Uh, not much of this has actually been done, but it's been discussed with the uh, Hadoop community. So what would an arc, uh, a scalable object storage look like? Uh, you'd, first of all, you get a bunch of API servers to serve your uh, you know, tens of thousands of requests per second. You'd authorize that API call, and then you would look, you would look up that object that which the API is talking about, and find that object or store the object in, uh, in, the, in a whole bunch of object servers. So a fairly typical object storage uh, architecture. Uh, you, you notice I also have a uh, set of replicators and auditors which make sure that there's at least three copies of your object at any given point in time. So uh, the, the talk talks about, well, why, you know, about using Hadoop or HDFS as the, as the uh, scalable part of this object storage, and why not? I mean, it's an ESF project, just like Apache Cloud Stack. Uh, it has immutable objects, so it has solved a very tough problem for us, which is how do you store three copies of an object in, a, in, a, uh, in an atomic fashion, and, and make sure there's always three copies of that object. Uh, it has you know, proven reliability, proven scale, proven performance. Uh, everybody knows that you know, writes and reads are very fast in, 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 uh, in, in HDFS. Uh, we have uh, data from the field, for example, from Facebook that they store you know, 200 million objects in one cluster. They've been able to store 100 petabytes in one cluster. And, and that's the kind of scale which uh, has not been seen in any other uh, object storage system. Uh, open source uh, out there. And it's relatively simple to operate. I mean, really, if you want to scale it up, it's no balancing of rings or anything. It's just add a node, and you're up and running. You certainly have new storage to play with. All right, so these are some of the reasons why, you know, we looked into HDFS. So, uh, so replacing the HDFS in, that, in the diagram I showed you before, uh, we got the S3 API servers getting authenticated by some authentication servers. And then we have a name node pair to look up where, the, where to store the object or where to read the object from. And then you have HDFS data nodes to, uh, to serve up the nodes or to, st or to store those uh, objects. So a fairly simple design. And then the API servers just need to talk the HDFS API uh, to, the, to the data nodes and to the name node. So, Again, a very simple architecture. Uh, this, in fact, exists today. Um, it's just not been tested at scale. So, but, so, as engineers, we love to have uh, design challenges. And so what's the gotchas in the simple architecture? Uh, the first one is uh, name node scalability. Uh, we know that um, each block and HDFS takes 150 bytes of RAM. And so if you have hundreds of millions of blocks, uh, you quickly run into very large RAM requirements. And then because this is Java-based, it doesn't handle that very well. You get GC pauses and all kinds of problems. And some of these problems are addressed. I mean, I'm sure, uh, for example, uh, there's Hadoop clusters out there running with uh, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Um, the name node is, uh, you know, widely known to be a single point of failure. 
However, that's being addressed in the community and that should soon be solved. It has been solved, but there's a few uh, uh, rough edges around, uh, around the HA process. Um, and then as we discussed this, I remember I talked about this high speed, low latency link between the data centers. Um, what if it's not there? I mean, Hadoop has a rack of air placement which you could take advantage of to place each object in a different uh, zone, but what if they're a little far apart? Maybe there's a four millisecond latency. Maybe it's a, you know, will HDFS work just as well? And that was not clear, and uh, the general feedback from the Hadoop community was, yeah, don't do that, because we don't know what's gonna happen. And then finally, um, we had MySQL before the store, uh, the, the mutable data, the ACLs, the policies, the timers on the objects. Um, where do we store that, right? I mean, we need to scale that aspect of the system as well. So the first problem, which is uh, name node scalability. So let's take our goal of a billion objects. So that translates to three copies. Um, three billion blocks. The reason I say three billion is because I expect, we expect the, the ob average object size to be fairly small, uh, five to 10 MBs. So assuming an average of five megabytes per object, you get about 15 petabytes raw. Not a great deal of uh, storage, but that turns out to require about 450 gigabytes of RAM. So quite beyond any current system currently, right? And then if you uh, crunch the number of data nodes that are required, maybe about 1,000 data nodes, assuming uh, 16 terabytes per, per node. So it's still not a uh, intractable problem because you have this nice thing called name node federation where you can split up the namespace into different name nodes so that now instead of running one single name node with 450 gigabytes of RAM, you could run maybe uh, 10 of them, but each are running with 50 gigabytes of RAM, right? The second approach you could do is Hadoop has a system called hard files where you can store many files together as one file, and then you can still retrieve one file uh, inside that archive. So that's a different approach, but that, again, that requires a, a layer of management outside of HDFS. So you know, name node federation looks like this. Uh, you have everybody, man each name node manages the same set of data nodes, um, thousand data nodes we're talking about. But then the, the namespace, uh, in, the, in our case, the, the bucket names will be uh, partitioned uh, between each of these uh, name nodes. So if you had uh, uh, a billion objects and 10 name nodes, then each name node would have a uh, hundred million um, objects to, uh, to take care of. So a tractable problem. Uh, but then I don't think anybody's tested uh, name node federation along with HA. So that's a new problem to be solved right there. Um, yeah, and then the second problem is that now that you've decided to shard your namespace amongst these 10 uh, name nodes, how do you decide how to shard them, right? So, so you either need a, a consistent hashing scheme or you need another database to store this mapping between your object name and the, and the particular name node that is being served by that object name, right? And so you require another scalable key value store and that's not a problem, we just use HBase for that because we know that scales to infinitely, right? Uh, and then the last problem is, well, as you run the system for a while, you're gonna get different name nodes with different sets of names, right? And so they're gonna be unbalanced, and so you'll have to run some kind of background process to rebalance these 10 name nodes amongst each other. And similarly, when you add a new name node, the scale of the system, uh, you're gonna have to you know, move some of the old load into the new uh, name nodes. Uh, the second thorny problem here is, and it's a really thorny problem because you want to do replication over slower and lossy links. And this actually was the, uh, the Achilles heel which uh, uh, stopped the project from going beyond its uh, 
a design stage. So first thing you could do is asynchronous replication. Uh, Hadoop has this very neat tool called DiskCP where you can replicate between clusters. Of course, this now means that you have six copies instead of three copies. And then you need to maintain some kind of master-slave relationship between the primary cluster and the and slave cluster. And so you got the possibility of you know, data loss when you do the failover, and you need some kind of additional coordination logic to say, well, who's the master, who's the slave, and so on and so forth. Or you could say it's synchronous replication. So the S3 API server can say that, aha, I've got two clusters, and until I write to both clusters, I'm not going to write uh, return an acknowledgment to the uh, to the end user. Well, what happens when your zone disappears, right? Then you then you're effectively uh, dead in the water, and then you you lost your availability availability goal by having two zones. And uh, this is not something new. Uh, we're just rediscovering the CAP theorem. Uh, the CAP theorem, for, uh, just as a refresher, it says that in a distributed system, you can either choose consistency or you can choose availability when during a network partition. You can't have both, right? And of course, there's many nuances on this, uh, but essentially, this is the problem we're running into. And so, uh, Perhaps it was the wrong problem to be trying to solve. So, uh, with, so if we did the uh, the synchronous approach, we would get consistency, but not availability. If we did the disk CP approach, we would get availability, but not consistency. Uh, the last problem is uh, well, where do we store our object metadata? Uh, so one option is we store it with uh, in HDFS along with the bucket and along with the um, object. Uh, but then reads tend to get a little expensive. So if you wanted to check the ACL before reading the object, now you've got to read the object, find the ACL, and then say, well, no. So you might have read a 10 gigabyte object, check the ACL, and then say, no, you can't access it. So that, that tends to be kind of wasteful. Um, and then the second problem is that it's mutable data because people can change their ACLs. It's not like an SG, it's not like an object which you either have to delete or to, or you have to delete or to append only. Um, so you need some kind of layer on top of HDFS to make it mutable. And it's not a new problem. HBase does it all the time. It has mutable data on top of HDFS. But nonetheless, it's a new piece of development that we need to do, which HDFS does not give us out of the box. So the second option is we use another storage system like HBase. Um, and as we saw before, if you wanted to do something like name node federation, uh, you would have to use HBase there or something like HBase over there anyway. Um, but then the problem of using HBase or any other thing is that it's yet another managed system you've got to manage, right? So HBase is like it's got the region servers, you've got the zookeeper, you got a whole bunch of new infrastructure you got to manage to keep up and to and to scale. So our our suddenly our simple architecture suddenly is becoming very very complex. Or we could store or modify the name node to store uh, the metadata, and this was something the Hadoop community was quite open to doing. Um, it would be very high performance, but it's not very extensible. So tomorrow Amazon adds the third kind of um, mutable thing into the, in an object, what do you do now? I mean, you can't go out, it's a very critical part of HDFS, it's not something to be modified easily. It's not something we can just say, aha, just a plugin or something. It's gotta be done with great care and, uh, and it's probably not a good idea to touch the main uh, path of HDFS here. So uh, what is the future for our object store in HDFS? Um, if, if we backtrack to um, the problems which I discussed, I think I started with a billion objects. Now, if a billion objects is not in your future, if you don't think ever that you're gonna get to a billion objects, um, then a lot of these problems don't apply to you. So maybe 
you just need it for 100 to 200 million objects. And we know that works. You know, if Facebook has deployed this, they do it all the time. And if your uh, data centers are close to each other or they're in adjacent rooms with a firewall in between so that they're not going to catch fire at the same time, it's a viable solution. And you could still store your MySQL, uh, your uh, mutable objects in MySQL. MySQL will scale to uh, 100 million objects, no problem. So it's a viable solution for that kind of deployment. The only question we have to ask ourselves is that, well, what about scaling to a billion? What about scaling to a 10 billion? Or what about scaling to 100 billion objects? So a larger deployment needs development. It needs solutions for the consistency and the availability portion. It needs solutions for a scalable, uh, mutable uh, data store for ACLs and, and, and other stuff. It, it needs um, uh, a significant effort to manage uh, the sharding between the, the name nodes and to manage the HA of the name nodes. And so at this point in time, there's no effort ongoing to solve this problem. And uh, it's something that the, I think the CloudStack community would welcome collaboration with the Apache Hadoop community. I think that um, HDFS is unparalleled in its simplicity, in its reliability, in its performance. Uh, there's quite nothing like it. And uh, I think the, the two communities collaborating together could uh, really put out a really great product, uh, which, would be, uh, which would make the Apache name proud, because it, Apache is all about infrastructure. Um, in, to conclude, um, CloudStack, to make uh, cloud-style workloads more reliable, it needs object storage. And um, it's, it, uh, from 4.0 to 4.1, it acquired that with the integrations with uh, React CS and, and, uh, and Swift. Um, however, object storage is not easy, and uh, depending on how much you want to scale it to, HDFS, it comes close, it comes very close to solving the problem, but it's not close enough for a general purpose object storage. And uh, we would welcome any uh, collaboration between the Hadoop and the uh, CloudStack communities to uh, solve this problem. Sure. So um, just a question, did you look at ClusterFS? Uh, we do not look at ClusterFS, no. Um, I think some of those claims could be uh, questionable about multi-data center especially. And um, I think uh, by trying to layer on a POSIX semantics, I think, it's, uh, I think it fundamentally makes the system less reliable. Um, but this was an effort to uh, incubate or to start a project in the Apache uh, Software Foundation with an Apache license. Not, not necessarily the license. It's not just that, but uh, I mean, uh, we could discuss the, sure. the problems with Gluster. Um, yeah. There's marketing claims and there's real, reality, of course. Sure. Sure, and um, and if you look at uh, the diagram I drew here, um, you know it's it's very similar to a Swift system where um, this is probably Keystone and this is probably their account container, account servers, um, and these are their. Uh, I forget what they call them. Uh, object servers, I think. Um, it's very similar. Uh, the, uh, uh, again, we wanted a project which would be uh, congruent with Apache Cloud Stack, well, you know, uh, perhaps use the Apache Hadoop. Uh, and as, as I said before, the performance, the, the reliability, and the maturity of, uh, Cloud of uh, Hadoop and HDFS 
is is quite. Uh, I mean, it's a, a great deal of thought has gone into uh, how to do it. You know, um, the fact that you can run a mutable uh, database like HBase on top of it, uh, it just means that there's uh, additional things you can do with it. Anybody from the uh, Hadoop community? Yeah, so the API servers I show you are not necessarily um, cloud stack API servers. Uh, today, if you deploy uh, S3 API in cloud stack, they run as a separate web app. And so there's no actually no shared state between uh, cloud stack and S3 API, except for the authentication credentials. Yeah, yeah. If you suddenly your a good chunk of your API requests are just to authenticate the user who's making uh, object storage calls. Sure, I mean there's there's different ways to scale that. Either you can put a, uh, a service layer on top of the AP of the uh, the credentials, or you could do some kind of a, uh, a lazy cache of you know there's uh, there's performance. Um, Tricks you can, or you know, or architectural changes we can make to uh, to accommodate that. Definitely, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you know. Um, typical when I when I I'm, I'm not a, a HDFS guru, but uh, uh, what I've read and what I've uh, seen on the mailing list, etc., that you know uh, people get worried when there's more than four or five milliseconds of latency. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not, that was the feedback you got from that. Right. Yeah, I would say that it's probably best to get so by its own infrastructure, uh, simply because you can optimize the hardware better. Um, when you deploy, um, what I, I could see sharing the same infrastructure is a, um, a MapReduce um, compute uh, on top of the same infrastructure. But I wouldn't run VMs on that infrastructure. You could do that. I think Andre's question was more about you're running VMs as well as uh, using the disk, which is on that uh, hypervisor to store uh, your objects. But yeah, certainly you could uh, leverage. Um, so I, I talked about a great deal about the management complexity, which uh, which we introduced by trying to scale up, like the uh, spinning up additional name nodes, maintaining HA for the name nodes, um, you know, managing a HBase cluster. Uh, certainly, all that can be automated with Cloud Stack, and so it, so these problems are not intractable, but it does require additional development on Cloud Stack as well as on uh, on HGFS. I was asking this question mainly because if you are going to build on top of this cloud store, such as like Amazon EMR, you can expect 
Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So um, VMs exact for 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 that one purpose. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. See, that would be a big advantage. Yes, definitely. You could probably speed up your uh, computations a great deal. Yeah. Sure. So uh, an object storage is typically a uh, HTTP-based API. So you can use uh, HTTP verbs like put and get and delete. And then that translates into uh, whatever the backing, the backing storage system, it can do whatever that uh, request means. For example, if it was a POSIX file system, if you put an object, it would you know, create the object on the file system. Uh, similarly, when you put an object in the HDFS as the backing file system, then it creates a block. Yeah. So it's a mapping between the HTTP layer to the backend layer. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, HBase doesn't have that many small files because what it does is it keeps appending to the same file. So, um, so you never run into the small file problem with HBase. And then, and then they do periodic compactions to make sure that uh, if they have a lot of small files, they compact them into into uh, into larger files. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, they. That's right, yeah. So then why not use HBase as the uh, You could, uh, but it's not, a, it's not designed for that kind of system. It's meant for a key value store. It stores a lot in RAM. Um, and so um, you would not see any performance gains necessarily. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then, uh, uh, it's possible, and that's another uh, design dimension to be uh, explored, definitely. Yeah, so Redux CS is really a key value in store as well. That's right, yeah. So uh, it looks like it would be possible. Yes, and, and, and we know that uh, there's other people who try to do object storage on Cassandra, for instance, and uh, uh, in, in that particular implementation, they ran into performance problems because the uh, Cassandra is architected for a particular use case. It just did not handle that kind of uh, use case. Okay. Thank you.